You're welcome to Candid Conversations. This morning, I said to you, the train will take us to the doorstep of another veteran. And we're in the office of Mr. Dele Adetiba, an advertising guru and an iconic sports broadcaster. Thank you for joining us on Candid Conversations. Thank you. On Candid Conversations, we talk to veterans, people who have been in broadcasting, locked down the profession. They have to look at what it is today, what it was yesterday, and what it's likely to be tomorrow. I'd like for you to take us through what it was for you, your very first day at work, and you recollect the first time you got on the microphone. The first time I got on the microphone, on radio, for broadcast. Broadcasting. Everything you've done in broadcasting. When was the very first time on the microphone? <laughs> Let, let me go back to the beginning. Um, the, the first time I got on the microphone for a broadcast, I was still in school. Okay. What year was that? You're trying to figure out how old this fellow is. No, sir. <laughs> this must be um, 50, 59, 60. Yes, okay. And um, we, we did a play, and Radio Nigeria came to broadcast it. That will explain my first time of um, going on air. And that's when I found out that I was naturally a fast speaker. Because when you're speaking, um, it's natural with you, so you have no idea what the pace is. But when you get to listen to yourself, then you, you can have a measure of what other people experience when they listen to you. Thereafter, um, my foray into broadcasting um, started with sports. Uh, um, they had a, a program in the old days, a deliberate policy of interacting with the public. So you had many people who broadcast things on radio without being members of the corporation. It was a deliberate policy in those days how to bring in the, the community. So you had um, people who would um, host a program, a discussion program, a musical program, who are not actually um, em employees or staff of what was then Nigerian Broadcasting Corporation or Radio Nigeria. So for a spell, I operated as an artist in sports. And then um, my first time I, I went behind the microphone, um, what struck me most was the preparations you had to do. Um, the producer, even though it's somebody you're familiar with, will put you through the grind. And the sports things we did then were live. So everything had to go right. And, and the producer took responsibility. You rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. And um, if you're not careful, you, you even get nervous because of the rehearsals. But what came through was you were left in no doubt that it is serious business. You don't come around off. It's got to be right. That's what I remember about my first um, the very first time yeah. behind the microphone. Now, you talked about preparation. How formal were these preparations that you had to do before going on It was very thorough. Um, in, in my time, although most people remember me as a sports broadcaster, actually I did everything. And I was also lucky, I should say, one of the few people who operated on radio and television. Because at the time I was on, um, Radio Nigeria and what was then NTA, or NBC Television was owned by the same corporation. There was no NTA then. So you, you, you would 
do some work on radio, and then the evening you go over to Victoria Island and do something else. I, I, I read the news, both on radio and television, um, and I did sports, both on radio and television. Preparation, say for the news, for instance, which was regarded as grade A broadcast. You will have your bulletin probably about half an hour before broadcast. And then you'll go through it, pick out the phrases. Uh, you, if you look at the script for reading the news, in those days, I don't know what they do now. It's almost, it, it was like a musical sheet because you mark the sentences at convenience places where you will pause and take off. And each person's pause is different. So you read it to yourself and mark. And, and it's, if somebody else is looking at it, is wondering what went on here. So you punctuated it. Every line. The way you want, you are going to sound. Abs you absolutely. Absolutely. That's when you are established. To start with, there will be a superior person to take you through it. You read to him, he listens, he makes comments. If, if, if you have what they call plosives, which is, um, you, you're making sound, which is th th thudding on the microphone, like plop, ply, plop, you know, popping on, popping on the mic, he'll correct that. If, you, if your um, breath control is wrong, he'll correct that. But very, most importantly, every word has to be correctly pronounced as it's pronounced in the English language. Do you recollect any time that you mispronounced the words, maybe a name or a place? What happened? <laughs> yes, I, re I, I recollect many times I did. Um, and I, I'll give you from two different angles. Um, on radio or television, your broadcast was listened to by the superiors. So um, you knew at any given moment that you were performing and that your superiors were, were listening. If you came up from the studio, after a broadcast and, and, and the, the telephone goes in the control room, either of two things. Either there's a fan who just watched you and wanted to talk to you, or your boss to say, what the heck did you call? So when the phone goes in the control room, you're a little apprehensive. And a few times you find um, uh, is the boss who's saying, call, call that word again. Names in particular, um, Macmillan. It's not Macmillan. So it, you're put to the ground, every word is listened to. You have to emphasize the stresses of every word. Absolutely. Part of the equipment, to use the word we had, was a book called Daniel Jones, which is... Um, um, a pronunciation dictionary. dictionary book. You had your Daniel Jones with you all of the time. So when you listen to radio today and watch TV today, what do you think? If you look at what it was, during your time and what you have today? Yes. Um, the main difference is I find people take it for granted now. We didn't take it for granted. When I was in broadcasting, there probably was about, probably three or four stations in the entire country. We had um, uh, Radio Nigeria, which was pervasive in most cities. But, but um, television, uh, NBC television, you had Ibad on WMBS, WNTV, you had EMBS in Enugu, ENTV, 
and we had RKTV in Kaduna. Just four. Therefore, the, the, you are a rare breed and you are made to know you are getting into an area that is very serious. In fact, the fable when we came was, in the early days, um, the, the fable we met was that the people who read the news on radio, um, in, in BBC in the old days, used to get dressed with tie and jacket and everything. Nobody saw them. But to give them that attitude of mind that is a formal presentation. So that, at, that attitude was what, what you had. We had only four stations, which, which meant you had to be on top of your game. Everybody who had a radio set or a TV set knew who you are. So if you messed up, you're messing up in the end to the entire universe. And of course, we had bosses who were going to listen to every broadcast. Let's talk about some of your bosses. Uh, who and who do you remember? Um, on radio, my... Well, some of the bosses we had then, of course there was um, Reverend Badiger, who was the Director General at, at the time. We had Reverend Lumide, who, after he left, uh, Dr. Kolade came in, Christopher Kolade. It, 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 it was my first foray with uh, Dr. Kolade because he was director of television when I was on TV. So um, he, he was my boss in, <laughs> on several levels. Um, so some of the most senior people, we had um, Sunday Young Harry, um, Emmanuel Omashola, Marie Rikefe, Stella Bassi. Those are some of the um, heads of departments then. And for my, um, I had an interesting thing when it came to sports. By the time I came to sports, the senior people had been moved. Someone like Ishola Fallon who is a, was, a, was a legend to everybody. Ishola Fallon was on the air when I was in primary school. You know. But by the time I came in, he had been moved upstairs to be a controller of programs. So I went through a period in which I was the head and the tail of sports broadcasts in this country. If anything had to be done, I had to do it. And um, which reminds me, if, if I um, veer off a bit, it reminds me of a, of a situation I found myself, um, our biggest opponent in football in those days was, was Ghana. Ghana was, was like a terror to us. The rivalry was intense. And uh, any time we had to play Ghana, everybody was, was on tenter hooks. We had this match on a Sunday, which meant, in any case, the broadcasting house was almost empty. Except you had the program, you had nothing to do there. And I had to go to the stadium. Overnight, Friday, Saturday, I developed a bad sore throat. By Sunday morning, it was burning. I couldn't eat, I could hardly speak, I couldn't even swallow. It was that bad. It was that bad. And there was only one person to do this at that time in this country, and that was me. So I had to go to what was then the KGV Onikon. I packed a little bottle of brandy. And you know when you do football commentaries or any commentaries, you projecting and lifting your voice, agitating the, the sore throat some more. So every 15 minutes, I'll take a swig and deaden the pain a bit to allow me to continue. So, so, 
was it that there were no other persons who could have been trained to assist you at that time? Sports commentaries is, 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 is a special um, area of broadcasting. And you, you almost need to have an aptitude for it to be, to be able to do it. I had bosses later on who were my superiors, but they, they never spoke one minute of, of sports broadcast. But they would just encourage me to say, go on, go on, go ahead. It was a specialized kind of thing. And you find that for those who were used to it over the years, you find um, maintaining the standard because you, you, you would have to have some people there eventually. Uh, maintaining the standard was very difficult. In my case, it was almost like an emergency. I was on television. The Shalafala show had gone upstairs as controller. Uh, it, was, it was succeeded by Yemi Fadipe, who took off on a study leave to, 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 to do a, a program in, in, in Lagos University. So I was drafted from television because they had known me with sports in my early, early forays into broadcasting. Subsequently, we had more people trained, and that's a, quite an interesting thing. I remember part of the training session we were doing for, we were having for some of the people who got interested after me and things. I remember a guy which went with um, a midget recorder to a boxing event, and um, we asked them to take five, 10 minutes each. And I remember this guy, when he got to his turn, he said, oh yes, yes, and um, oh, oh, he's on the left. Oh, ah, ooh. For five minutes, he was it just and practically, <laughs> That, that's what he did. So it, it's, 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 a, it's a different ca kind of broadcasting. It's a discipline which you, you have to get used to. Um, take football, for instance. One of the things you learn is the man listening to you, particularly on radio, is blind. So he's hanging on every word you say. Therefore, you don't have time to say who or her. He wants to know where the ball is on the pitch. Is it in the center circle? Is it in the center circle? Is it on the touch line? He wants to know who is with the ball. Is, is it the outside right? Is it the, the center forward? He wants to know who is attacking him. If you bring down the ball, he wants to know whether you brought the ball down with the side of your foot or with the in, in step. In other words, you're painting a picture in words, putting in as much detail as you can, and trying to keep pace with the movement of, 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 of the ball. It's, it's a daunting task if you're not used to it. But there's a lot of who and I happening today in sports broadcasting. What do you think about that? There's so much flowery description, and people are flowing with it. Part of I always uh, hesitate to criticize the younger ones because they're operating in a different environment. Earlier on, I said um, there are only four stations in this country. They pro probably have like 60 or 70 or 100 or more. So what you find is there's a proliferation, and therefore, um, the rigors which you went through before you were allowed to even move near a microphone in those days doesn't exist anymore. Th there was a term that was prevalent in those days to say, who let him lose on the mic? It's, it's like some, you let a mad person be behind the microphone, untutored, untrained, unsupervised. But was there a generational change of that term? when we were there, the people need to go down like that, like that, you know, down to what it is that we see today. 
there was to some extent. What happened along the line? What you'll find is in every area of our national life, yes. things have deteriorated. I mean, it's just a fact. Whether you go into teaching or into medicine or into whatever, things have deteriorated a, a bit. Um, what, you, what you had in, in those days was um, the dedication, and it was almost like a food time occupation. When I was on, on radio, for instance, I, I didn't even have a weekend. My, my, my main broadcast was on Sunday, in which we reviewed what went on during the week. On Saturday, I had live broadcast, even if only two goats are playing on, on, at the stadium. We had a fixed 4 o'clock to 6.30 on air to fill. So I didn't have a weekend. Even though I didn't even realize it then, I was having too much fun, you know. And um, so you, 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 the, the dedication has changed a bit. The supervision has changed. Um, as I said earlier on, when you were on the news or whatever broadcast it was, you knew somebody was listening who was not just a fan. You had a boss who was listening. And one other thing, we had a, we had a, 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 pro, we had a schedule every Thursday morning. People who were who operated behind the microphone, not the technicians, not the producers, but the, what they call the voices, whether you're a news reader or a um, continuity announcer, whatever, on TV or radio, we will assemble on Thursday morning for a meeting, a review meeting, which had all the bosses. So what did you talk about in these meetings? What went on during the week? And people are picking up, I listened to you on, on Monday, you did X and Y, or on Wednesday, that was very good. Then there was always one recording to play back by somebody you will not know who was recorded. So you walk into that studio for the meeting, you have no idea whether it's you or anybody else that was recorded until they say, play. And then they play the whole thing and then um, everybody will comment, make their comments, the bosses will tear it apart if it needed to be torn apart. And um, you'd, you'd be congratulated if you did well. But what it meant was at every moment, you knew you were being watched. That hasn't been the case with the younger ones. Um, you, you, for many of the younger ones, there's a, I get the impression of celebrity. I hear on-air personality and, and all of that and all of that. We didn't, we had that, because in fact we were very few. So we were the, the nearest thing to Hollywood in those days. But that is outside of the studios. In the studio, you better behave. Some big brother was watching. I listen these days, well, they don't even do much of sports broadcast these days anymore. But, um, number seven, Jersey, number nine, you dared not say that in my time. Because what did I meet? You will go to the camp of the players when they were practicing, days before the match. You will get used to them. You probably know them by name. Know them by name and by face and by gait. So that when the man is moving on with his back turned to you, you have an idea who it is. And of course, you'll have your, your broadcast thing on your table, who is um, on the other side, the goalkeeper, the, and all that. So you're following this and all that. You dare not say number nine. And we learned at the foot of the masters, he would go like clockwork two, three days uh, when the, the players are in camp. 
and mingle with them and talk with them. In my days, I, I knew almost all the boxing clubs in Lagos because I would go to their camps when they were training and things. And um, uh, most of them knew me then. So what special training did you get to, to be that good? You said you were the head and the tail of sports broadcasting. What special training did you get to be that? And who actually trained you for the job? As I said, I, I, I got, got in with, with feet first, kind of. Mm. When I started off, I wasn't even a member of staff. I was like an artist, which was part of the program of uh, interaction with the public and the station. There was a deliberate attempt to get people to broadcast who were not members, you know. So I had started doing this even at that time. And of course, we went through the... the, the uh, Yemi Fadipe was in charge then. Once in a while, I, I interacted with Shola uh, Folo Nisha. But um, you went through that process uh, gradually before you even build your confidence to know you could do it. But the truth is, like everything else, there's a bit of talent involved. Um, we all have certain talents for certain things. So um, um, if, if you have the talent, it's easy or a lot easier to adapt and, 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 and go on as, as situations presented themselves. Um, when it, the training was a little more formal after, yeah, uh, after, after our time, but by the time I left, that's, that's the other thing. There were about three or four people in, in the, who, who had joined me by the time I was leaving. We had um, someone like Yinka Craig, uh, Sebastian Offrum, Ernesto Kunko, you know. They joined um, before, before I, I left. So, so did that make your work lighter at some point when they, they came on the ferry? Yes, it, it, it did. Because you could take um, so, some of the strain off. Mm. In broadcast, live broadcast, um, I shared with somebody. In other words, the old tradition of um, you, you do 22 and a half minutes, the other guy does 22 and a half minutes for the first half, you do an, another 22 and a half. So you could share the broadcast. Whereas before I did everything, mm. you know. And, and then uh, even the, the sports coverage itself, um, outside of the live broadcast, you still went out there to cover events and report and things. And um, we still maintain, in my time, we still maintain that involvement of the outside community. Mm. We still had people who would come and report on, on various um, uh, sports for the weekly review on Sunday. And some of the big names in the, in the country were involved with us at, at that time. Uh, and, um, and it was the same thing on, on, on television. Um, you, the, the preparation was a little more strenuous on TV because you are, yeah. you are in, in view. Yeah. Um, you, you, the trick with this is you learned if you did well, then people believe in you and almost believe as if you're telling the news. If you didn't do it well, broadcasting is a very funny thing. If you're, if you're doing well, everybody thinks you're a genius. If you, if you fall flat, the thing you can't even manage to, to Take a, a glass of water by yourself. You're such, such an idiot, mm. you know. So it's from one end to the other. So th does it mean it's a thankless job, like so many people have, have you know, turned it? I wouldn't say a thankless job. Um, for, it, for, for a start, mm. we had a kind of 
should I say brotherhood, which would not be apt in the sense that we also, we also had females there. But we had a bond. I, I spoke with, with an old colleague two days ago, two, three days ago. I hadn't seen him in 30 years. We met on my forays in those days because, like I said, I was the only one. So if there was a broadcast in Enugu, I had to go there. If there was a broadcast in Kaduna. You had to be there? Yes. He was in Enugu. And um, somebody just mentioned to me that, um, do you know, Mr. X is going to celebrate his 83rd birthday. And I said, are you serious? You have his number? I said, yes. And, and, and I picked up the phone and called him. He nearly jumped up through the roof. So there was that bond which never ceased. When I, when I was leaving broadcasting, on like what people think, I didn't jump hooray. Thank God I'm, I'm walking away. In fact, I was very reticent. They had to chase me with a letter and whatever. I was having too much fun, you know? I... Like I said, I didn't have a weekend, I didn't have... But I enjoyed, I enjoyed every, every minute. So I wouldn't say thankless. Um, if, if you enjoyed it, if it's your line, the kind of thing you love to do, um, you were able to cope. Because we operated on both radio and television in those days, sometimes um, you read the news maybe 12 o'clock on radio, you go over to TV, do some paperwork. Maybe you're reading the news later on in the evening, yes. 7 o'clock, 9 o'clock, or whatever. So you find that, in fact, your day was booked. And in a way that you can hardly do much in between. You, you can't run, run from Ikoi to Surulere or whatever it is in between. So. Um, you, you were consumed by the work, but you, the atmosphere in Broadcasting House made it fun. If you also enjoyed what you did, it made it even more fun. Hmm. Why, why uh, was it that we never heard a woman in sports broadcasting during your time? Was it that they were not interested in joining that line? Of, uh, of, of, of broadcasting? Probably, but um, you'll find that in general um, there were a lot more men than women yeah. in almost all areas of broadcasting anyway, let alone the specialized one. I, I'm not even sure I've seen anybody, any woman who did sports commentaries. You, you've had females now who did sports programs. Reporting. reporting and hosting and things. But even to, today, I don't think I've seen any woman who did. So what does it take uh, to be a commentator, a sports <laughs> commentator? First of all, you've got to know the sport. You can't comment on what you don't know. I was lucky that I was always exposed to sport. I had always been interested in sports. And um, therefore, you knew what to look out for, say, in football. Somebody who had a, a, a good uh, body swerve, mm. the ball control, the team movement, and all that and all that. If it's cricket, you've got to know how many balls make an over, what kinds of balls are bold, is it a fast bowler? Is it an off break? So you must know all the terms. Oh yeah, you have to know all the With terms. Respect to the different kind of Absolutely. If it's boxing, is it a left hook? Is it, is it a straight right? Is it a jab? So you, you must be interested to start with. I was lucky that I was exposed to sport very early. I, 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 did, I did a show um, even after I left broadcasting. For many years after I left broadcasting, broadcasting didn't leave me. Most people didn't realize I had left broadcasting even when they were seeing me on air. Because t television still gave me a one-hour broadcast every week. Why did you leave? Why did I leave? 
I was persuaded. Um, I had some colleagues in advertising okay. who sat on my case, you know, and um, the forms were brought to my house <laughs> to fill. And when I went to for, for the interview, one of the bosses who interviewed me was, in fact, my artist on radio in those days. I told you people came from outside, you know. And, and, and he said, so what am I going to ask you, Dilly? I know, I know you too well. That was that. So that, that, that was why I left. Like I said, I was very reticent about leaving at, the, at, that, at that time. But um, so it, 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 you didn't feel um, the pressure because if you enjoyed what what you did. So, what do you think that the, the young ones of today should know? What do you think they should know? Because so much is happening. We find that people who don't even know anything about the job now own radio and TV stations. We employ people and mandate them to speak with foreign accents. What do you make of that? You know, when you talk about the foreign accent, it's, it's, it's like when, when you go to the airport and they make an announcement in absolute gibberish because they're trying to speak in a foreign accent. And they call, they murder the words. The fact of life is like, like maybe in Yoruba or any other language, every word has the way it must be called to be intelligible to anybody who spoke English. Yeah. You can't devise it by yourself. All passengers going to Edmund, and a good now join us for. Nobody knows what you're saying. You know, most of them are just singing. I think the, the, the problem was what I alluded to earlier on. There's a proliferation of stations. They need people to man the stations. Um, as you said, some of the people who own the stations were not professionals themselves, and uh, therefore the standard didn't quite matter. Um, many of them, even if they listen to what the fellow said, don't know any better. So the training that went with it, the attitude that went with it, has changed. You were a big star in my time, outside of the studio, you know, but within, you knew you had a piece of work to do. I mean, you, you may be narrating a, 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 a recording for somebody, some of our producers in those days, half an hour. It might take you two hours to record. Because one fluff is cut is going back. It doesn't matter, another take. It doesn't matter how long it took. You were going to be there. So the, the, the drive for excellence was there. But the fun about excellence is you have to know what that excellence is. Otherwise, I mean, I see people now maybe at a party with what I consider colorful dress. Because I, I'm, I'm not too much into fabrics. I'm not even know which, which is a more expensive one. Those who know will say, don't mind that one. It, it, it's just colorful for nothing, you know. So excellence is when you know what it is. Yeah. You can't fake it. And if your bosses don't know, then they can't stipulate it or insist on it. Yeah. The biggest problem, I think, with, with the younger ones is um, the... The, the process of taking over of pro proliferation. At the beginning, many people who, who got into broadcasting, TV in particular, took their cue, took, took, had their from WMBS. It was the first station. So when N N N NTS or N NBC television was, many of the technical people were, were from WMBS. People like Julie Cook had, had been WNBS at some point, uh, um, Rosemary Anese and things, Remisho Kefun, Shegun Shola, 
you know, came from, from WMBS. So you found that there was a movement of trained people fanning out into new establishments. But when the establishments were proliferating faster than you were producing the personnel, so anybody was now free. And the attitude also changed, in, in which case you didn't think it was work. It was so much of um, being a star, you know, which um, takes away, detract from what you're, what, what you're trying to do. Hmm. So brings us to the issue of advertising and radio or television. I know your time at that time, government took care of everything. But today, most stations depend on what it is that's coming from the advertising agencies. What kind of influence do you think that they have on what it is that we watch today and the things that we listen to? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's unfortunate. Maybe, maybe it's sad as well. Look, a couple of years back, I was involved just like, I don't know, seven years ago, eight years ago, well after my broadcasting days, I had even retired from advertising as such. But I was involved with the Football League in, in Nigeria, which was almost at its infancy and we were trying to set it on, get interest back on. And I went to Radio Nigeria, my, my old hunt, this, I had to talk to the director general, which I did, if they would carry football broadcast every week for free. In my days on radio, we paid a token to Nigerian Football Association. Even in those days, let alone now in the days of, of commercial, whatever it is. You paid for content. Yes. For music, for everything that you need. Yes. There was some kind of royalty. Absolutely. If you were going to play a radio, uh, sorry, a, a record for a musical program in those days, you will have to list it so that they can have a copyright release. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you couldn't just go on and play anything. You, like. you have to fill a form and list it so that you can pay. And, and same thing for the, for the broadcast we did on, on football. We paid NFA. So you went to Radio Nigeria, what happened? And I spoke to this, uh, I think it was a lady then, yeah. And she explained to me that they don't even have a slot for sports. I mean, I nearly tumbled. This was the same establishment in which I spent about, I don't know, five years of my life. Every Saturday without fail, we had two hours of broadcast. Apparently, all they did now was lease the, the, the time away to religious people who paid. One religious broadcast or the other populated the entire schedule. They couldn't find a space for sports, for sports even for free. So when you have situations like that, don't be surprised, nobody does sports commentaries anymore. They, they have no need for it. There's no practice. There's no process of development. It's a, it's a different ball game. So you're right. Um, the, 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 the search for money and revenue has taken over what the um, philosophy of broadcasting was in our time. It was a deliberate thing to educate and uh, uh, um, connect with the outside public. That's why people were, were brought in, people who, important people, ordinary people like me, um, permanent secretaries and things who, who had a regular program on radio, who were not members of staff, you know. It was a deliberate process. Now. I don't even think they have any, everything has changed. It's now, what can I do to fill this, this place and, fi and bring in money? And that has, it has greatly affected the project. 
clearly. As, as it is. So let's talk about training. How important is training for anyone who wants to go into broadcasting? Like anything you want to do um, in life, you need some training. You know, many just branching. Maybe my, my dad's friend has a radio station and I can speak good English. And they say, look, that is just go there. Take your paper there. That, that's, the, that's the unfortunate thing you've, you've seen. Look, th there's a way to do things. Take interviewing, for instance. It's an art. Sometimes I, I listen to an interview on radio, whatever it is, Some, sometimes even international television. And I know they're doing it wrong. Part of what you're doing is you're putting yourself in the shoes of the listener to try and elicit from your guest what that listener wants to hear, the kind of questions in his mind which you would like to, to hear. Which, which means you must know the subject. If you're going to, to interview somebody about oil exploration or, or whatever it is, you must know about the oil industry in the country. If you're going to interview some, somebody about sports, you must know the subject. I, I remember talking about that, I, I, I did a series once um, sportsmen of yesteryears, in which I call all kinds of people who had donned, who had, had done Nigerian jersey over the years. And I, and I spoke to a gentleman called A.K. Amo. He was a sprinter. Um, he was on the world stage even as far back as 1960. And I, I, I spoke with him and I asked him, what happened to you on that day at, at um, the USC grounds? USC grounds then is where you have the, um, the Slim Balogun Stadium now, yeah. you know, in Suri So it used to be USC grounds. It was athletics. And this gentleman participated in three events, 220, um, 100, 100 yards and 440. He won each one and fainted after each one. So when I asked him, what happened to you that day? He looked at me like, how did you know? Because I was there. I was a young schoolboy, but I was know your subject. So he explained to me it was University of Ibadan at that time. He had to come to Lagos for the, for the uh, contest. He was a Muslim, he was fasting. And he wouldn't break his fast for, for, for the games. So each game, each race was a strain. Very rigorous for him. Very rigorous for him. But luckily he had about two hours in between each. And, and I was able to pull it through. The point I'm making is, if you don't know your subject, you can't have a good interview. And the art of particularly if you have a regular program, for instance, it's your guest that they want to listen to. They see you every week with one guest or the other. So don't monopolize the, 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 the space. And keep hearing yourself. Yes. Too many people are too busy printing themselves, wanting to look intelligent to the, to the audience. It's unnecessary. What you want to do is bring something out from that guy which people out there would like to listen to. That they don't know. That they don't know. Once you can do that, your job is done. So every, everything you do in life, in broadcasting, every area of broadcasting, um, there, there's a need to learn how it's done, everything has a process and a procedure to, for you to get the, the, the best out of it. In our case, a, lo a lot of it was in practical terms because we had superiors who took time 
to take you through. We did have um, um, a language laboratory, you know, at some point, um, a few years after I, I joined, um, in which you actually go through the um, broadcasting laboratory and um, sort certain things out. Um, we all sometimes have some words that trip you off. So they try and sort you out, you know, a, a, a laboratory. I, I know a colleague, one of my senior colleagues in those days, who couldn't, just couldn't deal with the word radiated. And in those days, you have to use the word radiated every day because you open the station broadcasting on such and so on, we're radiating on. So the word was always there. And, and she was always in trouble. <laughs> but um, you have to, you, learning is the important thing in any trade and knowing that you, 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 you don't know it all. We all keep learning. When I joined advertising, for instance, part, part of the, the part of it is the humility of knowing that you're in, in a business which you know nothing or next to nothing. And um, I'm sitting at a, at a meeting sometimes and they're speaking English and I don't even understand what they're saying. They're telling me about 40 sheet and 15 sheet and things and years after well, months after I realized they were talking about outdoor and the various sizes of outdoor and things and all, and all that. Every, everything has a discipline which you pick up and learn and in my, well I mean when I became um, an, an experienced person, a, a supervisor, a manager, a chief executive in advertising, you also now get to a point in which you can look at an artwork and say, why did you put the he headline here? You, you've, you've cluttered this, the, 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 the space. Where, where is the copy line? Move it to one side. The things that come to you with years of, of doing it. And those were the terms for that kind of job. Absolutely. You, uh, and and you, must learn. you have to learn it. You have to learn it with humility. You have to learn um, what, what the tricks are so that you, you, um, it becomes second nature to you. Well, let's continue. What are you doing now, you know, presently? Because um, I know that broadcasters never retire. <laughs> so what are you doing? Well, the, the, this... The consulting for stations and mentoring people. What are you doing? This one is retired. <laughs> That's the second person I'm hearing who's saying I'm retired. Mr. Fabricio would have said, look, if you have retired, I'm done, I guess we should go and rest. I still, I, I still do some consulting, which is why I'm, I'm here. I still do some cons consulting now and again, okay. you know. Um, but by and large, I mean, I, I, I retired from... from, from linked us 22 years ago yeah. you know <laughs> so um, so you just enjoy your retirement I still got consulted but it's it's I, I don't I, I didn't have to come to work yeah. every, day. every day or whatever it depends on what I needed to do okay. and, and things and all that yeah. So is there a book? Are you writing your memoirs? Is there something you can, you know, refer to, uh, to read and to know more? I hope I, I, I could. I hope I would. Um, because some of the experiences that you share, that some, others, some, of, some of your other peers have shared, these are experiences that, are, that you can't buy with money. Yeah. We need to have these things, we need to read, it should be in the library. Because many young ones don't even know what it is that you've talked about. Right. Yeah, and, and there are anecdotes that um, I, I, I love to share also with highlights of my career. Um, the, 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 the situation Uh, that got me a little worried 
like, like, like being evacuated with, in an ammo tank in Congo, mm. you know, after a football match in which the football match finished like about 6.37. The entire stadium remained seated. They weren't going anywhere because we beat them. They switched off the lights and they were throwing stones. And we had to be evacuated um, in, in, in an, an armored car. I also remember some fun things, which would be fun, fun. I was doing a football commentary sometime, and um, the captain of the Nigerian football team was Christian Chuku. In the heat of the broadcast, trying to call Christian Chuku, I called John Chuku. I don't know if you guys. Uh, we were around when John Chuku was, was alive. He was a very well-known uh, artist, comedian and things and all that, broadcaster and everything. Nothing to do with football. So I was trying to call Christian Chuku. I called John Chuku. So many of my friends still make fun of me till, till tomorrow. Were you penalized for that? No, no, no. Okay. Um, and talking about being penalized, I, I, I remember doing a broadcast in National Stadium. I came, came down at halftime to interview the managers in front of the entire field stadium in those days, which used to be massively filled. And my, my, my daughter was with me, so I, I came down, left her with one of the cameramen, and, and went to interview this guy. We just started. And my daughter bolted from where she was and ran into shot. And the whole stadium went gaga, you know. But it became fun. I wasn't penalized, you know. And um, maybe they, they even enjoyed it. Yeah. So you go through. And in, even in advertising, one of, one of the stories that I always enjoy is um, I was with a colleague yeah. you know, making a presentation and. Um, Something came up, and, and my, my, my colleague was, was feebing, trying to cover up something. So he was pressing my leg, or so he thought, so, so that um, I don't feel I was taken unawares by what he was saying. Mm. Unfortunately, he was pressing the client's leg. <laughs> and the client was wondering what's going on. What's here? going on? <laughs> So there are, there are anecdotes which, which one would like to share. But well, hopefully you can share some of these or all of these in a book. So I hope so. Get to you. Because the reading culture is dying. But when yeah. you don't write, how will people get to read about these things? It's, it's a pity because um, it's, like, it's, it's like go to your old school. Mm. And sometimes you're, you're worried what you meet now. Mm. You know, um, you... you you have the nostalgia of walking the grounds when you were there, but you find everything has changed, not for better. Um, so sometimes that's how I feel about broadcasting. Um, when we were in broadcasting, I like, I like to say I was in the transition period between the first generation broadcasters who worked with the expatriates you know, and those were the should have followed the shows of this world, Marie Vicky Fay, you know, and all that and all that. Um, on to the, the next generation of, pe of people. It was an exci exciting time. You had a tradition which you had to maintain. That's what the, the expatriates passed down to them, which they passed down to us, which we passed down to the ne next generation. The link seems to have been broken somewhere along the line and so you go in there even when you look at the, sh the programming it's not what it used to be yes uh, and some of the things that we've talked about is what informed us the 25 mistakes that radio presenters need to avoid i don't know if you'll have time to take a look at you know the glossary and see some of these things where people say that i'm famous i'm a brand 
nobody can, you know, correct me as it is. Did you see these things, um, you know, during your time? No, no. It, 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 it. From the one you were made to know, um, you had a job to do. You were, you were performing. The, the stardom was outside. I, as I said to you, we probably had more stardom then than people think they have now. Be, because there were, there, were, there were very few of us then. Almost, as I said, you finish a broadcast, you're, you're te you're, you're f the phone will go in the control room. You have some fan or the other tr trying to reach you. But that, that's where it ended. People wanted you to host their, their party, their dance, their whatever it is. The pressure was on. And we didn't, we didn't get paid a penny. I mean, it wasn't for money then. They just wanted it to be present in their midst. So there was that stardom, all right. But when you're performing, um, the only way you can sustain your stardom is that you sustain your, your productivity and being able to do it day in, day out. I mean, sometimes, I, I, I've been in Europe, sometimes, and, and I hear, it's a goal. And then I'll turn, I'll find it's some Nigerian or something, and, and I'll, joke, I'll kill him and say, you must be old, because if you still remember me, then... <laughs> All right, sir, so this is the content yes. of the book. Maybe you just want to take a look at, you know, some of the things. I have to share some experiences there, because yeah. many of the young ones we have today, they don't even understand what it is. And you hear things like, and the brand, who needs a script, because they think they can speak, you know, off the curve. And they make a lot of mistakes. It's a, mis it's, 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 it's a mistake. I... I, I I made a speech once. Um, where was this? Um, oh, I had, I had to make a, a speech on behalf of Equate Club. I, I, was, I was chairman of Equate Club at yeah. some point. I had to make a speech on behalf of Equate Club. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I finished, <clears throat> everybody was like, wow, you're, you're a good speaker. You, you didn't even hold any paper. What they didn't realize is that I scripted what I wanted to say. <laughs> I scripted what I wanted to say two days before. I'd read it a, a, a number of times. I knew the train of thought that I wanted. I may not now repeat every word that's in that script, but it was a familiar terrain for me when I was speaking. So um, when people have this attitude of, um, I don't, who, need, who needs a paper, who needs a script, it's bad training. It's very, very bad training. To, to broadcast, to do musical programs in that, in, in, in our days, you will have to script it. You will have to script it. You know. All right then. Um, would like to thank you so much for. Hopefully, we we'll get to hear more from you. I'm looking forward to reading. If you have something that you're putting together, because it will make a lot of sense for some of us who are still in the profession and growing in it. Because we do trainings also, but when we get to talk to people about persons like this, some people don't even know. Um, the young ones of today don't have the time. Even though we have smartphones, mm. they don't even know what they're looking for. As it is. So we're grateful. Thank you for opening your doors to us. You're um, welcome. Thank you very much, sir. All right. Thank you.